Hi everyone. Now, as I mentioned in our last class announcement, we still have a little bit to calculate for our research report. So here I have essentially what we've completed in class for, well, in my case, Visa. Uh, your companies will have obviously different data. And we, as of the last class, got down to the point where we were ready to use the two-stage discounted cash flows model. And to get us started, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to calculate the weighted average cost of capital. And we've already talked about this function in Bloomberg several times, so I will just go ahead and walk us through how to get that. It's just the WACC function. And I've already got Visa loaded here, so you know you can change that to whatever your company is. But Visa's weighted average cost of capital, its discount rate for all of its future cash flows or free cash flows to the firm is 9.2%. So that's what I'm going to enter right here. Next, our long-term growth rate. And our long-term growth rate this is the growth rate that we assume after the terminal value period. So just to refresh your memory, What we're doing is we're breaking up our valuation of whatever stock we're analyzing into two distinct parts, the forecasting stage and the terminal value stage. In the first stage, we're going to directly estimate the free cash flows. So you'll see, or you've already seen in our spreadsheet, we're doing that over the next three years. After that, we're going to assume that our accuracy for free cash flow estimation is pretty lousy. And so we're going to assume that our free cash flows grow at a constant rate forever. So what we're going to use is the Gordon growth model. But in that model, we need to know our free cash flow in the last forecasting period. So for our cases, this will be three years from now. We need to know our discount rate, which we just found using the weighted average cost of capital. In my case, it was 9.2%. And lastly, we need to know the long-term growth rate. And that is where we need to make some, some estimates. Because, uh, it, I mean, you can use the other methods, but arguably the best method or way to calculate a long-term growth rate is to set the growth rate of whatever firm you're dealing with, their free cash flows equal to the long-term growth rate of the overall economy, which in the U.S. is typically said to be about 2%. So that's what we're going to do in our research report. We're going to assume a 2% growth rate. So 2%. Next, we need to estimate our free cash flows. And we want to get them over the next three years. Now, there's several ways that you can do this. I would strongly recommend that if you're going to do, if you have access to Bloomberg, the way to do this is to go ahead and use the free cash flow function. So let me show you how, you get, how to get that. To get estimates for your, for your free cash flows, you're first going to go to FA, and then you're going to go on the default page all the way down. to where it says free cash flow. And I know we've talked about this, but these are all of our historical numbers. And then in white, we have our estimates. Now notice here that we only have two years worth of estimates. So this would be T plus one, year T plus one for my firm, Visa. This would be year T plus two. And if we wanted more estimates, we could click on either of these numbers. And we have some more details about each of these estimates. However, let's say I wanted to know what the free cash flow was estimated to be in uh, year T plus three, so three years from now. For that, 
I could use the EE history. And what that is going to do is that's going to allow me to look up any estimate that's made by analysts for any particular time period. So right now our default is the year 2022 and our current estimate is 15 billion 378 million in terms of free cash flow for Visa. To get our T plus 3 estimate all we need to do is just change the year. So if you'll indulge me what I'll do is I'll go back and collect the first two years and then I'll get our year T plus 3. So first things first we need year T plus 1 for cash flow for that year. Next we need our cash flow in year T plus 2 and that's right there. That's our best estimate. And then finally we need year T plus 3 and that's where I'll just click on this, go to EE history, make sure this is set to free cash flow and change our year to year 2023. And here is our current estimate, about 17 billion and change, 17,286. So I entered this as a number because if you copy what it says on the EE history, you'll, you'll put a B in there and that will tell Excel this is not a number. All right, finally, we need to get our terminal value cash flow. So this is where our Gordon growth model comes in. We're going to use that $17 billion free cash flow that I just collected. We're going to take our 2% growth rate, our 9.2% weighted average cost of capital, and plug them all in here. And this is going to tell us how valuable or how what the value of all free cash flows after year three is for Visa discounted back to year three. So I'll zoom in so it's a little easier to see here. So we have our, let's put some parentheses around these, our year th T plus 3 cash flow times 1 plus our growth rate of 2%, uh, and those parentheses, close them, and then take all of that divided by our weighted average cost of capital minus our growth rate. And there we go. All right, next, we need to, we want to get all of our free cash flows in order. In other words, we want to know what our free cash flow is in year T plus 1, T plus 2, T plus 3. And right now we have our terminal value period valued for year T plus 3 plus our actual T plus 3 cash flow. We want both of those in the same cell. So to do that, I'm just going to, for each year, sum up all of our cash flows. And that'll allow us to use the NPV function, the net present value function, to calculate our discounted free cash flows. So here in cell B72, I'm going to set my rate equal to my weighted average cost of capital. So what is the discount rate for these free cash flows? Well, it's going to be your weighted average cost of capital if these are free cash flows to the firm which they are. So there we have that. And then we just highlight our stream of cash flows. And the NPV function will automatically discount all of these cash flows to the present. Then we need to get our cash, preferred stock, debt, and then shares outstanding. And then finally, after that, we'll be able to calculate our intrinsic value. So where do we get that? Well. I know I've said it several times, but the FA function is our most useful function. So if I go back to the FA function, make sure I have Visa loaded, all of that information on cash, preferred stock, total debt, it's right here. So all I need to do is just copy this information over. Here's our preferred stock. and our total debt. And now we calculate our intrinsic market capitalization. And we're going to do this by taking our discounted value of the firm, which is what this is. You can think of this uh, this as the enterprise value. We're going to take this 
and then we're going to add in our cash and then subtract out all of the various liabilities and preferred equity that we have here. So minus our preferred stock and minus our debt. And this tells us, this 217.6 billion, this tells us that the intrinsic value of Visa's market cap, all of its stock, is equal to, well, this, 217.6 billion. To understand what our intrinsic value is, next we need to calculate our number of shares outstanding. And to do that, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go over to the balance sheet and hopefully we should have a number of shares outstanding, which at the bottom here we do. So currently, or I should probably pull our gap highlights. So I guess the latest year for which we have uh, shares outstanding is going to be the, the end of the fiscal year 2020. So what the number that we're going to use is the shares outstanding on the balance sheet, and that number is 1.9 billion. So these are in millions. So 1.939. And then lastly, to calculate our intrinsic value, we're just going to divide our intrinsic, intrinsic market cap by shares outstanding. And now we've got our first intrinsic value based on the two-stage discounted cash flows model. This is the number that we're going to compare with the current share price to determine whether the stock is undervalued or overvalued. If we just use this number, I mean, at the time that I'm recording this video, I believe Visa is priced at about $210. So if we just use this number, we could say that we, we feel fairly confident that the stock is overvalued and we might want to sell it or short it. Uh, but we'll come to that in a second. The last thing that you need to do in terms of data collection, uh, well, one of the last things you need to do is actually collect a spreadsheet template from Bloomberg. And I've given you a description of how to do this in the comment here. So what we're going to do is, let's zoom out a little more, we're going to use the XLTP function in Bloomberg and then search for the template XDCF. And what this is going to do is it's going to allow us to download a template that does essentially all of the two-stage discounted cash flows valuation we just did. And it'll also perform sensitivity analysis for us. So let me show you this. XLTP. And we'll search for XDCF. And notice we have a couple of models here. The one we want is the, well, this one right here. So I'll open it. And I'm pretty sure I've shown this in class several times when we talk about valuation of certain stocks. But this thing automatically pulls data directly from Bloomberg into a spreadsheet. And you can change the name of the company or the ticker symbol of the company to whatever your firm is. So mine is Visa. So it's Bloomberg ticker is V space US. Your firm is very likely going to be, well, if you just type in your firm's name, the Bloomberg ticker symbol will just be typically your, your standard ticker symbol with the letters space US after it. So in this case, VUS, this is my spreadsheet for Visa. So notice here that the uh, current share price is about 206.90. And this is what we're after, the sensitivity of the intrinsic value. So Bloomberg is making some some different assumptions from what I was. But notice here that we have some missing data. And this is an issue with uh, some companies in Bloomberg. N namely, we don't know what the estimated sales growth rate is going to be, or rather what the estimate is. So 
for this one, for Visa, we actually need to do a, a slight correction because right now uh, the model is not taking into account either year 2026 or any cash flows after that from the terminal value. And this is one of the big drawbacks to the uh, using someone else's model. Sometimes you'll get errors, and this is why we always want to create our own model. So your firm might not face this. I mean, IBM, I don't think, had any issues. Uh, but what we need to do, or what I need to do right now, is I need to go down to whatever the cell this thing is referencing, T55, and I need to see what fixes I need to make. Uh, chances are I'm just going to make a very simple fix and yes, year over year growth that seems a bit unrealistic negative 72% in uh, for total sales in September of 2025 and essentially a complete loss of sales in September of 2026 so what I'm going to do here because I I just don't think these are realistic. I mean, basically this implies that the firm, that Visa, will not have any sales in fiscal year 2026. What I'm gonna do, just for the sake of simplification, I'm just going to assume that this grow, these sales grow at a 2% growth rate. If I were spending more time on this, I might uh, alter this more accurately, but just because I'm recording video and I really don't want to dive into a deep discussion, we're just going to set the growth rate in sales equal to 2% for both of these. And now we actually don't have missing data for either year 2026 or the terminal value period that comes after that. And we also have some more realistic estimates of the intrinsic value. I mean, it's still, under, uh, still overvalued relative to you know, market price or sorry, market price is overvalued relative to the intrinsic value, but you know this this is viable. I mean, we calculated this using uh, data that we collected a few minutes ago, or something very close to this. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to copy our sensitivity analysis for the intrinsic value from here, and you can notice that different models will give you different intrinsic values. Uh, so this one, it's using market multiples in the terminal value period, and it's actually finding a, a positive valuation. And I mean, this is why we always want to use multiple models. But for the sake of simplification, I just asked you for uh, what I just highlighted. I'll paste these as values. And here we go. I mean, our intrinsic value in the template, if we make some small corrections. You, not everyone will have to make those corrections, but if you make those corrections, here is our intrinsic value of Visa. So now we have all of the intrinsic values that we need. Uh, so let's take a look at this. Uh, I believe we just calculated the share price of Visa at 206.90. So 206.90 is what I'll put here. Our intrinsic value, uh, we know that we've calculated several intrinsic values. I mean, we calculated these from our market multiple section. And then with the Gordon growth model, we calculated a, an intrinsic value of negative $9 uh, for Visa. And then we calculated two intrinsic values with respect to the two-stage discounted cash flows model. And admittedly, there was another intrinsic value in here uh, using the market multiples approach in the terminal value period, but I've not shown you that, so you don't need to do anything with that. Uh, so now, this becomes a decision for us. Based on these intrinsic values, what do we expect the, the actual, what are we going to report as our actual intrinsic value? I mean, you could go many different ways here. I mean, at this point, it does become a judgment call. So do you, take an average or the median of these, or maybe one of these numbers is more accurate because maybe uh, this is a, a de novo firm or a, a firm in a particular industry that uh, you know two-stage discounted cash flows just wouldn't be applicable for with high volatility. Uh, for the sake of simplification here, what I'll do is I'll just take the average of all the realistic numbers. 
uh, not including the negative valuation. So I'll just take the average of everything that I had here. And that would give us six different models. I'm not reporting the negative number because that, that is completely unrealistic. I mean, you, you can't have a negative valuation. So uh, there's six numbers here. I'll divide by six to get an average. And when I do this, I'm getting an int intrinsic value of 341.54. Uh, like I said, this part is where it becomes a judgment call. So take this with a bit of a grain of salt. Uh, there are many ways to do this. It, it does become your judgment. This is your call based on the numbers that you have pulled. Uh, everything that you have prior to this point, I mean in the in terms of data collection, uh, what I'm going to do when I grade this, I'm, I'm literally going to create functions so that, or templates so that I can just change the, the firm names and all of this data will come right up and I'll be able to see, did you get exactly what that, num that same number was? And if not, well, potentially points off or, you know, I'll, I'll dive deeper into them. But uh, uh, this one is where you get to give it your best shot in terms of estimation. Next, we use our target share price or get our target share price. And I know I've talked about this a couple of times, but our target share price is equal to the intrinsic value times one plus whatever our cost of equity is or required return is based on the cap app. And we did already collect that down in cell uh, E61. So this was the required return for Visa or the cost of equity of Visa, and it's calculated using the cap M. So I'm going to select that and close my parentheses. So we're just estimating uh, if this is the fair value or intrinsic value of Visa today, what is the value of Visa a year from now, assuming it's fairly valued. Well, it's this. And then at this point, it does become a, uh, well, I'll, I'll complete the potential upside. Uh, so the potential upside is calculated. You, uh, I mean, there's several different ways to calculate this. Uh, I'd rec I would like you to calculate it as just the percentage difference between the, the target share price and the current share price. So in this case, it'd just be target minus current divided by current. And so our potential upside, assuming that our intrinsic valuation is accurate, and I mean, again, estimate, uh, this stock has an 80% upside. Now, realistically, I know I've talked about this in class, market multiples, uh, well, right now, valuations are extremely high. Uh, so that's likely what's inflating these market multiples and driving some of these way higher than the current share price of the stock. Uh, I mean, I, I've always believed that the the intrinsic value using two-stage just kind of cash flows for firms like Visa is probably more accurate, but uh, again, this is your call. Uh, so based on the potential upside, is this a, a buy? Well, if everything was going the same direction, this would very easily be a buy. If every if every intrinsic value found uh, or was greater than the current share price, we could say with some confidence that we would recommend a buy. Uh, right now, just because my intrinsic value or my average value is so much higher than the, the current share price, I'll say buy. And uh, then I would explain why that is. I mean, we, we do know that Visa if we look at their profitability, they are profitable. Uh, they do, they are relatively efficient. I mean, they're, uh, they've become less efficient in the last year, which is not good. Uh, but their direct competitor, MasterCard, has also become less efficient in the last year. Uh, the firm is, uh, I mean, it, it's, become more highly levered, but again, that's the same with MasterCard and a lot of other financial services firms. Uh, the Altman Z score is above 1.81, so we're good. Uh, cash ratio this year is above one, that, uh, sorry, uh, current ratio is well above one, so that's good. Uh, I mean, 
I really don't see any red flags with respect to the, the ratios, or at least the time trend or peer group analysis. I mean, Visa does, it, it is more liquid than its direct competitor. It uh, admittedly is closer to bankruptcy than its closest direct competitor. Uh, it's less indebted than its closest direct competitor. It's more efficient, uh, uh, according to accounts receivable turnover, but uh, in terms of total asset turnover, the firm is less efficient than MasterCard uh, in terms of allocating assets. Uh, but it is, I mean, based on the profit margin, more profitable. Uh, ROA flips that. ROE definitely flips that. And, I mean, that... Uh, so. All in all, I mean, yeah, it's it's relatively competitive in terms of its ratios. I don't see any red flags here. And the intrinsic values, I mean, just the mean itself uh, suggests that this thing is arguably undervalued. Uh, so I would actually give a one paragraph explanation of that. Uh, so, you know, something like uh, the ratios are trending in the po in a positive direction. Uh, this firm out is more efficient than its direct competitor. It's more profitable than its direct competitor, et cetera, et cetera. And, you know, we, we found that uh, the majority of the intrinsic values that we calculated were above the current share price. So if I was going to complete this, that'd be about what I would say. So, uh, there we go. Now the, the final step for this is to format it and put it in a Word document. And uh, what I'm looking for, and you'll get full credit if you complete this process and make it more or less look like what you see here. Uh, I, I want this on two pages. I want to be able to print it off and then review your work just by looking at a piece of paper, one piece of paper. So if you can format your spreadsheet here and then copy it into a Word document and change the margins uh, to make it look like mine, you're in business. I mean, you are in business. I, I think uh, I think I actually explicitly stated that uh, that's somewhere in here. Well, uh, you, you will be handsomely rewarded for making yours look like mine in the Word document. So uh, when you submit that, just do your best to make it uh, make it look like this. Uh, accuracy of the numbers is obviously very important, but presentation is also important. And so uh, we as analysts want to be able to put together a, a document that is easy to read, like this one. Uh, so with that, I'm going to wrap up. And if you have any questions, uh, obviously reach out to me, and I will see you in class.